Well, hello everybody and welcome to the Bear Trust's summer lecture. Uh, this is our third online lecture since March last year. I'm Nicola Ramsden. I'm the Chair of Trustees of the Bear Trust. Um, I'm delighted to see how many people have signed up. Some of you might not have heard of the Bear Trust before. So just very, very briefly, uh, we're a UK based charity and we try to improve the health and welfare of vulnerable groups of people in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. So broadly, most of the countries of the former Soviet Union. We rely on our own fundraising to work. Um, so many thanks to everybody who was able to donate today. Um, we use your money to run information services. Um, if you want to know more about that, have a look at our website, which is bear, B -E -A -R -R dot org. very simple. You can find out more there. Um, but the largest single item of our budget is giving small grants to support health and welfare projects run by local people on the ground. And we're very strong believers that the best ideas often come from the grassroots. Um, we can only fund less than 10% of the grant re requests that we receive. So fundraising events like this are very important to us. And we are extremely grateful to Oliver Bullo and to John Lloyd for making, making this possible. I was absolutely gripped by Oliver's book, Moneyland, and I have been a huge fan of John Lloyd's thoughtful journalism for many years now. I expect there'll be a lot of questions. Please put them into the chat function um, and John will moderate them after Oliver's finished his lecture. Um, just a few technicalities before I hand over to John. Uh, as usual, we will all be on mute during the lecture. It would be very nice if you can keep your video on, but no problem if not. Um, and just a reminder that we are recording this event. Um, thank you. Uh, that's all from me for now. And I'd now like to hand over to John Lloyd, our chairman. Many thanks, and I'm very glad to be here and also to, to do it for the Bear Trust, which I know, whose work I know well. Um, our, talk, our lecturer today, uh, Oliver Bulo, published a book um, already, already advertised uh, about three years ago called Moneyland, and it was subtitled Why Thieves and Crooks Rule the World and How to Take It Back, which gave, gives you a measure of the ambition of the writer, uh, which has gone beyond that of writing a book. He's just written another one, uh, which is, will be published soon. The subtitle of Moneyland uh, borrows from the tag that uh, Alexei Navalny has put indelibly, we hope, upon Vladimir Putin and his party, uh, United Russia, Partia Zhulikov Ivorov, party of thieves and crooks, this president, this party, uh, rule a vast country and they are the law. And he, as much, probably more than, than almost anybody else, has made that clear in his writing and his activism. But Moneyland goes beyond Russia. It, it says that uh, the possession of the world's wealth uh, is, one might say, a, a global pandemic. Moneyland is a global tour d'horizon which should be read especially on Russia but on the way in which wealth um, multi multiplies itself uh, in various ways um, and it's also very good very tough on the laundromat which is a large part of the business of the city of London they say he's just finished another book he's going to draw on that for what he says today he and a partner uh, have run kleptocracy tours around London to show people what money can buy, 
not mainly in Tower Hamlets or Hackney, but in West London, Chelsea, above all. Uh, and he runs a website called Coda Oligarchy, which he says is about tracking uh, how the super rich are changing the world for the rest of us. It's not just a measure of his ambition, but it's a measure of the seriousness of the work he does. And it's a great pleasure indeed uh, to have Oliver talk to us today. Thank you very much, John. And thank you very much, Jane, for inviting me and for the Bear Trust for hosting me. It's really exciting to be able to have a captive audience to rabbit on about kleptocracy, which uh, is a subject that I really like rabbiting on about. Um, because of the pandemic, we, that is Roman, my co-conspirator and other friends and I haven't been able to hold a kleptocracy tour in London since, I think the last one we had was just before the first lockdown, since I suppose March last year. Um, they are essentially modelled on the um, Hollywood tours that you can go on in Hollywood, where you get driven around in a bus and they will point out, um, you know, the house that used to belong to Charlie Chaplin or, or where Scarlett Johansson goes to have a latte or whatever. I, um, I don't have any photos from the actual kleptocracy tour for you, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and share my screen. Um, at least I hope I am. And here we go. And so what I'm hoping that this will be able to show you, there we go. This is not an actual kleptocracy tour, but this is a cartoon that was shown in The Economist um, when they were writing about our kleptocracy tours um, uh, a couple of years ago. And we don't actually do it in an open topped bus. That would be more fun, but you can't really rely on the weather. So we tend to use an ordinary coach. And we start off as a rule uh, in Westminster, just down the road from the Houses of Parliament. Um, and then we uh, get everyone on the bus and we drive through West London. Um, depending on the traffic, we sometimes might go up to North London to sort of Highgate as well. But, but our normal sort of stomping ground is West London in the general sort of Knightsbridge, Kensington type area. And I mean, depending on how we feel and who we've got as the guards, we might, you know, we'd start with Igor Shuvalov, who used to be the deputy prime minister of Russia. Um, he famously was exposed by Navalny for having um, a private jet that was largely at the disposal of his prize prize winning dog shows by private jet at about $40,000 uh, a pop. Um, uh, then we might go down to Knightsbridge to see the house of uh, Dmitry Firtash, a Ukrainian uh, gas billionaire who, who made a lot of money partnering with uh, Vladimir Putin and Gazprom to, to um, sell gas to Ukraine and make a huge amount of money for both himself and Vladimir Putin into the bargain. Um, in 2014, actually, in an extraordinary deal, our government actually sold Dmitry Firtash a tube station. Um, sorry, just getting used to this thing. There it is. This is a tube station that he sold, that, that Dmitry Firtash bought off our government in 2014. Um, tragically for Mr. Firtash, um, uh, just a couple of weeks after the sale went through, he was arrested in Vienna on an FBI warrant. So he's never actually got to enjoy his tube station. It wasn't ever entirely clear what he planned to do with the tube station, perhaps. I think he was probably planning just to convert it into a house. But as it stands, it's just sort of stayed empty for the last seven years, um, which is a great shame since a rather eccentric uh, businessman at the time called Ajit Chambers had a rather good idea to turn it into a tourist attraction. But anyway, um, so we might uh, look at the tube station. And then, like I say, if the traffic isn't too bad, we might go up to St. John's Wood to see um, the former head of Russian Railways mansion, or to Highgate, where we could see Wittenhurst, the second largest house in London after Buckingham Palace, which is owned by a former member of the Russian Upper House of Parliament, um, and which was developed at huge cost um, uh, in the years running up to the 2012 Olympics. Some felt as a residence for Vladimir Putin, but that was never really proved. Um, now, our uh, kleptocracy tour has got a fair bit of um, uh, press coverage. Um, and to be honest, um, that was fun, but it was only really a fraction of the um, kleptocrat impact on London. They don't just like buying houses, they like buying yachts, they like buying fine art, they like buying politicians, um, they like buying educations for their children, they like sponsoring art galleries, they like doing all sorts of things. London is a really great place to spend money and it has um, a really excellent combination of very strong defence of property rights and also very weak enforcement of financial crime regulations, 
which means that once you get your money here, your money here is safe, not just from rival oligarchs who might take it off you, as they might do in the countries of the former Soviet Union. It's also safe from being confiscated by the law enforcement agencies because we don't really have any. Our um, international corruption unit at the National Crime Agency has a budget of just over four million pounds a year, which, as anyone who's been reading the story of the Hajiyevas, realises that the four million pounds is the kind of money that an oligarch can drop in Harrods on an ordinary trip. So um, it's frankly um, a pretty good place to be an oligarch. And, you know, also that means it's a pretty good place to be a journalist because we do like writing about uh, oligarchs. Here are a few stories about the kind of things that Russians have been buying in, in, um, in London. Um, property, obviously, but also art, as you can see at the top. And But, uh, I mean, Russians are really just the kind of the most visible side of this. It's not just Russians, obviously. We all like writing about Russians, but there's also plenty of Ukrainians, Azeris, um, Kazakhs, uh, Nigerians, Angolans, you name it. Uh, London is welcome to welcoming to absolutely anybody. Um, but I think perhaps as journalists, we're all a little bit guilty of writing about this as if we're writing about the Kardashians or, or some kind of reality TV show. You know, these oligarchs with their, you know, huge wealth coming here and spending money on 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 luxury goods it all seems terribly amusing when actually it, it's really quite serious i've spent a, quite a lot of time working particularly in ukraine an area that i'm sure um many people associated with the charity are are, are very familiar with um and there the the cost of corruption is almost immeasurable ordinary people's lives are um ruined by their encounters with the um, state authorities, the difficulties they face in trying to access healthcare or education or justice are, are appalling and often um, denominated not just in money, but also in, in, in cost to their real human lives. One family I became quite close to in Kiev um, um, in, in the years after, immediately after the Ukrainian revolution 2014, um, uh, Nina and her daughter Nonna, um, Nonna is a haemophiliac. Um, so she requires regular injections of blood clotting factor in order to be able to live an ordinary life. Um, now in Ukraine, there is a constitutional uh, guarantee of free health care for all Ukrainians, but, you know, that's rather honoured in the breach. Um, and in order to <clears throat> attain the clotting factor, um, her mum needed to pay bribes that she couldn't afford, which meant that essentially her life and, uh, and that of her daughter had been entirely put on hold um, she, she wasn't able really to ever leave her daughter alone. She wasn't able to let her daughter go out to play. She trained herself to recognise the smell of blood so that if she was sleeping next to her daughter, if her daughter started bleeding in the night, she would be confident she would wake up and would be able to try and seek treatment. That is what corruption means. This isn't just a question of, of money. It's also a question of people's lives, people's lives being absolutely ruined by it. And, and that this is the kind of money that in London we, we enthusiastically welcome into our property markets, our fine art markets and so on. It's um, a national disgrace, really, and it's it's a great um, uh, it's source of embarrassment to me when in conversation with friends in, in Ukraine and Russia and Azerbaijan and elsewhere, um, trying to explain why Britain doesn't do more about it. Um, uh, we just had the Queen's speech yesterday, and once again, Britain has done nothing about it. In fact, there was a, a promise to try and reveal offshore ownership of, of uh, property in London in the last Queen's speech back in 2019, uh, that never promise was never kept, and in fact, it appears to have been quietly dropped. It certainly wasn't included in the Queen's speech this week. Um, so why aren't we doing anything about it? Well, often um, people will tell you that the reason we're not doing anything is because the money is hidden offshore, it's washed offshore. By the time it arrives in the UK, it's very difficult to tell who it belongs to. It's very difficult to do anything about it. And there is, of course, a certain amount in that. Um, but it's certainly not the whole story. Um, we could be doing a lot ourselves. We could be doing a lot more ourselves. And in fact, our failure to do it ourselves is almost something that provides cover to tax havens to prevent them having to do anything about it either. Um, um, so what I want to talk about is how our role in the UK as an international financial centre is something that stops us doing anything about um, international corruption. And I want to start off talking about um, a... a a crime that many of you probably remember at the time uh, in Moldova back in 2014, uh, what, what was probably by comparison to the size of the economy where it happened, um, the largest bank heist of all time, when just under a billion dollars was stolen from three Moldovan banks and, and um, 
spirited out of the country uh, whence it vanished, causing a political crisis in Moldova. It was no, it was a some uh, approximately equivalent to one eighth of the size of the entire Moldovan economy at the time. So a truly vast sum of money by Moldovan standards. The, the equivalent sum of money um, for the United States, I think, would be somewhere around two and a half trillion dollars. A vast, vast amount of money. Um, the biggest bank heist of all time. But but where did it go? You know, where did all the money disappear to? Well, it was last seen in the possession of a, a Scottish limited partnership, a, a Scottish shell company in a flat in, in, in Edinburgh. Um, um, uh, uh, something that was sufficiently peculiar for obviously Scottish journalists to be very interested in it. They were tipped off by the police in Scotland. And there we go, there's a couple of headlines from um, the, uh, the Herald in Glasgow and, and also from uh, the BBC, Farlan 4. In fact, you can see there that, that rather un, undistinguished looking property was the address where the billion dollars was last seen. It went in through the front door and then vanished somehow without ever going out, out the back. Um, the um, mystery of what happened to this billion dollars um, was just one of many, really, um, many Eastern European uh, money laundering scandals of this nature tracked back to shell companies registered in Edinburgh or Inverness or in other Scottish cities. Um, we saw uh, the money laundering scandal in Danske Bank, uh, which ended um, with uh, the whistle being blown by a whistleblower called Howard Wilkinson in 2013, um, in which 200 billion euros was moved via Danske Bank's Estonia branch um, to who knows where, somewhere into the international financial system, again, overwhelmingly owned by British shell companies, as we can see from this chart um, published by the lawyers who looked into the scandal. Um, the, the line in gray is the ownership um, from the UK of bank accounts at Danske Bank, as you can see from 2011 onwards, the single largest share of bank accounts was in UK, U, were UK owned. That doesn't mean British people, that means British shell companies. There was also a sizable chunk from the British Virgin Islands, just to show that we were um, uh, in first and third place um, in, in the ownership of these shell companies. Um, the um, Shell companies in, in question, these were not, not limited companies, but what are called limited partnerships. They're a very peculiar hybrid form of structure that have a sort of best of both worlds quality for money launderers in that they look legitimate um, because they're British and Britain has a good reputation, which though perhaps by the end of this talk this evening, you may wonder whether it deserves it. Um, but they have very minimal uh, disclosure requirements. Unlike a limited company, you don't really have to um, publish accounts. You don't have to say who owns the company, you don't have to have any actual individual people involved with them. They can be controlled entirely by other companies, by corporate structures. And in the case of these shell companies that own bank accounts at Deut uh, Danske Bank, um, they were controlled by shell companies in, in traditional tax havens, places like the Seychelles or the island of Nevis or the Marshall Islands. So what you had essentially were extremely murky, anonymously owned um, shell companies, which because they were registered in Scotland looked legitimate and they were owning bank accounts at Danske Bank and moving a truly incredible amount of money. Um, $200 billion, just to, uh, euros, sorry, just to put that into perspective, if you were to try and count 200 billion euros, if you improbably enough had a pile of 200 billion euro coins and you were to count them one a second until you were done, that would take you about um, 6,000 years. So if you'd started a, around about the time of the Trojan War, you might be getting to 6,000, uh, you might be getting to 200 billion around now. And that was just one scam. Uh, Swedbank, another Scandinavian bank, moved uh, about 130 billion euros, and others were, were almost of the same size. Um, you know, and obviously these banks deserve a certain amount of blame, quite a lot of blame for moving all this money. But really, the the, the key uh, role in disguising the ownership of the money and allowing its owners to move it into international financial system was played by the shell companies, and the shell companies were provided, of course, by Britain. Here is uh, some testimony given by Howard Wilkinson, the Danske Bank whistleblower. Um, to, uh, to a parliamentary inquiry in Denmark um, about those shell companies. The worst of all is the United Kingdom. The role of the United Kingdom is an absolute disgrace. Now, obviously, with a scam of this nature, a series of scams of this nature, it's truly vast, what are called laundromats uh, by the media. I always think it's a bit um, grand calling them laundromats. It may sound a bit, a bit exotic. I think we should call them laundrettes to give them that sort of rather more feeble, um, sordid, 
aspect. But anyway, laundromat is what people call them. So let's call them laundromats. These series of laundromats moving money out of um, Russia, Ukraine, uh, Moldova, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan into uh, the Western financial system via shell companies registered in the UK. Um, it was epidemic and it was so huge that you would expect a, um, a government response, to be honest, because it becomes such um, an overwhelming um, scandal. And uh, certainly there was a lot of pressure on the government uh, to take action from um, the Scottish National Party, which I think because of the Scottish limited partnership aspect of this felt a particular responsibility. Their Treasury spokesman uh, back in 2016, um, or after this, uh, particularly the Moldova fraud was revealed, uh, was, a, was a, um, a chap called Roger Mullen, who, um, who was very exercised by this issue and really raised it in the parliament in Westminster whenever he could. Um, he, he asked questions of, of the then Prime Minister, uh, Theresa May. He, he had um, hearings. And he brought down journalists who wrote about this to try and raise awareness of the issue around Scottish limited partnerships and the damage that they were doing to Eastern Europe by facilitating the theft and the laundering of such vast amounts of money that really should have been um, being left behind to help you know, people like Nina buy medicine for her daughter, which is what this money was originally intended for. Um, um, you know, and, and I, I mean, I do have a, just to show um, the, the extraordinary nature of this scam, the sheer number of Scottish limited partnerships being created was out of all proportion to anything that had previously happened. I think there were more SLPs registered in 2016 than there had been in the entire century following their creation in 1907. I think I have a chart now coming up to show quite how many were created. There they go. Um, it, after the laws around companies were changed in, in 2006, which is where the arrow is on the chart, and which meant that, that actual limited companies weren't so useful, limited partnerships became attractive to money launderers. We can see the sheer number of them increased uh, every year from then on all the way up to 2015. Now, it was, a, it was an, an epidemic of money laundering, all under the cover of um, Scottish limited partnerships. Um, and uh, so Roger Mullen held these hearings in Parliament. He, he, he raised this um, with officials at the Treasury. He raised this with anyone who would listen. And he had a lot of success in terms of gaining attention. It looked very heartening. Um, you know, in, in, in early 2017, um, the government uh, committed to holding a consultation as a first step towards tightening the rules to make sure that this kind of thing could not, never happen again. And, and this, is, this is heartening. This is what Parliament is supposed to do. You know, the media um, discovers a problem. The media informs a politician like Roger Mullen. Roger Mullen takes it to Parliament. He holds hearings and the government agrees to do something about it. It was you know, very pleasing and um, it really looked like everything uh, was going to be sorted out and that these kind of structures would never be allowed to be used for money laundering again. The money launderers would have to find something else to, to do, something more difficult. It would be harder for them to move money and more expensive, which is, after all, what we all want. Um, Sadly, however, there was a problem. There was a, uh, a grain of sand in this particular, no, hang on, there was a fly in this particular ointment, a grain of sand is different. Um, uh, the problem is that criminals were not the only people using limited partnerships. Now, limited partnerships, they were created in 1907 and they were largely used for much of the 20th century just for holding agricultural tenancies in Scotland. They were quite useful in specifically Scottish conditions, but um, after the nine, following from the 1980s, there was a second constituency who discovered how useful it was to have essentially a tax free structure to hold assets, which no disclosure of any kind. So no one knew that you owned it. and You didn't have to pay any tax on it. It was a sort of um, heads I win, tails you lose structure, which frankly, anyone with money is very much in favour of. Um, you see, uh, criminals were following a trail blazed by private finance. Um, hedge funds had discovered uh, limited partnerships in the 1980s and large and they had become the the vehicle of choice for most private funds in Europe for holding assets um, and this is a, a, a story I tell quite often in Moneyland when um, financial uh, institutions discover the use of a, of a structure of a particular way of moving money and then after financial institutions have blazed the trail the trail is then followed by criminals and the amount of money being moved by financial institutions was far larger than the amount being moved by criminals, 200 billion uh, euros may look like a lot of money, but it's nothing compared to the kind of money being traded and moved around by hedge funds and private finance in, in, the, in the offices of Mayfair and the city of London. Um, so when Roger Mullen was really hoping that the consultation um, 
would bring tighter rules for limited partnerships. He was extremely shocked when the government announced or that it was announced not only that there would not be tighter rules, but actually just a couple of months after the consultation, the government was creating a new kind of limited partnership, not with with um, far looser rules, the PFLP, which rather annoyingly shares an acronym with the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, which makes it quite difficult to Google. Um, the PFLP would in fact become even more loosely regulated than the Scottish Limited Partnership. The, 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 the problems the SLP faced in order um, with anyone trying to track its use for money laundering would be greatly magnified by anyone trying to track the use of the PFLP for doing it. Um, and Roger Mullen is absolutely furious about this. Um, he thought he'd won a a, a promise to tighten the rules on limited partnerships, and instead the rules were loosened. And he went to um, to to the the Treasury, um, to an official from the Treasury, and he said, "What's going on?" Um, and what she said, Gwyneth Nurse, they are definitely not going to clamp down. They are by their nature deregulatory. The UK is open for business. We are interested in modernising our regulatory regime. Now, what was the concern? Why was the government instead of tightening rules on limited partnerships in order to prevent money being laundered out of Eastern Europe and being used to buy mansions in, in uh, Knightsbridge and Eaton Square and so on, the ones that we show off in the kleptocracy tour. Why was the government um, loosening the rules that were already doing so much damage? Well, the concern was that um, various you know, uh, individuals in the, in the private fund industry had suggested to the Treasury that if the rules were not relaxed, they would take their funds out of London and move them to Luxembourg, that they would, instead of having their, their money managed out of London, they would move their money to Luxembourg because Luxembourg was promising to treat them better. Um, and they, they demanded that these particular changes be made, and so the changes were made. Uh, the government calculated that by deregulating the limited partnerships, the average fund would save over the course of about a decade somewhere between £15,000. In fact, I think the specific figure is £14,700 and £27,600. Uh, this amount of money was deemed to be um, uh, welcome enough to private funds to keep them in the UK instead of having them move to Luxembourg or Delaware or wherever. Um, now, obviously, it's all well and good that private funds will be staying in the UK. We want employment. We want taxes to be paid. But if you just step back a little bit and look at that sum of money, a, a, a saving for an average fund of 14,700 to 27,600 pounds, that is an utterly trivial sum of money. Um, on that estimate, it would take Britain's entire fund industry 230 years just to save the amount of money that was stolen from Moldova in one year in 2014, in that one bank job. And I know even I, my, my mathematical brain would break down before I tried to work out how many years it would take um, uh, Danske Bank to earn back the 200 billion euros that it moved um, in the years up to 2013. Um, the, is, the needs of the city were put ahead of the needs of the people of the former Soviet Union so spectacularly that it's almost impossible to try and work out what the calculation was. Um, the city's desire to save um, less than 30 grand was put ahead of Eastern Europe's desire not to lose, when added all together, possibly a trillion that was that was laundered out of it in a decade up to the mid um well up to around 2015 um and this is not an isolated example again and again and again we see when suggestions are made in the uk that we need to clamp down on um money laundering we need to try and enforce money laundering regulations um that these regulations are not introduced um, we've seen this with this idea that there needs to be open access registry of who owns property, not just who owns property in their own name, but who the actual real people who own property via an offshore shell company. The vast majority of the properties we show off on the kleptocracy tour are not owned in the name of Vladimir Putin or whichever kleptocrat um, actually owns them. They are owned via shell companies in the British Virgin Islands or a trust in Jersey or a foundation in Liechtenstein or wherever, which effectually disguises the ownership of, of the property and makes it impossible to discover who actually owns the property without a court order in that jurisdiction. Um, there has been a government promise uh, now for seven years uh, that uh, an open registry will be introduced to cut through all that flim flam so you can just see which individual actually owns this property. This is a promise that was the one I referred to that was in the Queen's speech um, in 
uh, the end of 2019. It was never introduced last year. Well, I think we can we can say that that's kind of fair enough. There was a lot going on last year, but it has vanished from the Queen's speech this year, and we have no idea when it might be reintroduced. Um, Companies House, the UK's corporate registry, which is so badly registered that any of you could log on right now while watching me talk, could create a profile on Companies House, could create a company just by putting any information at all in any of the boxes. You could just type random letters, heaven knows people do, um, and you could be in possession of a company of your very own before I finished speaking. Um, uh, that Companies House, again, something that there has been promised to, to regulate, to properly regulate for four or five years now, once again, that is entirely missing from the Queen's speech or any kind of order of government business, even though they recognised in their integrated review in March that our failure to adequately reform our shell company system is something that is playing into the hands of kleptocrats because it allows them to hide their money. Um, um, th these are um, many, many um, different examples. I could go on and on and on, in fact, I probably will if given an opportunity, just to show that um, Britain is not taking the issue of financial crime seriously. In fact, um, in the uh, Intelligence and Security Committee report into Russian interference in the UK published last year, there was this extremely alarming quote from the director of the National Crime Agency. The National Crime Agency is supposed to be our FBI, is supposed to be manning the or womaning, in this case, the front lines of um, our fight against dirty money. But Lynn Owens, the director, said that, um, frankly, I'm going to try and remember the quote, so I'll probably get it a bit wrong. Frankly, she's concerned about the impact on her budget. Many of these oligarchs um, are able to retain the best lawyers. We saw this last year when the National Crime Agency tried to go after some property owned by the daughter of the former president of Kazakhstan, um, which they suspected had been bought uh, with uh, illegally acquired money. Um, uh, Dariga Nazarbayeva, the, the daughter in question, um, retained Mishkondare, um, the famously potent London law firm, and was able to essentially destroy the NCA's case. Now, I'm not saying that the NCA's case was necessarily correct, but if you see um, the remarks by the judge in, the, in, in her ruling, in which she found against the National Crime Agency, you will see that they produced a, you know, um, frankly, a, a very, very poor um, response to Mishkondare. They really um, did put up a very bad show indeed, so so bad that a, an academic I know suggested they did it on purpose. It so, seems so inexplicable. But actually, if you realise that the budget of the International Corruption Unit is only £4.3 million, when you compare that to what an oligarch can spend on lawyers, which is essentially a bottomless sum, you realise the National Crime Agency has no chance at all. Um, you know, the uh, the UK is, 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 a, is an open, wide hole in the world's um, defences against illicit finance. And while there is one country that is an open loophole, essentially the money will keep flowing and will never stop. Um, so why does this matter? I suppose that's the question. I don't know. I'm hoping that um, considering uh, you all have a prior interest in, in, in helping ordinary people rather than oligarchs in Eastern European countries, I'm hoping that you all um, have a sort of a prior prejudice, if prejudice is the word, in, in, in why this matters, that you all realise that if money is laundered um, you know, by uh, officials, politicians in places like Moldova and Ukraine and is laundered to the UK, that is both bad for Moldova and U the Ukraine because it takes away money that they desperately need to support public services um, and uh, public infrastructure. And it comes to the UK where it's bad too because it just pumps up house prices and increases inequality. But how do you explain that to people without perhaps your, your background in it? Um, so we, I suppose, tried to, when doing the kleptocracy tour, we tried to explain this in, in the question of house prices. You know, the, um, here we go, it's uh, Eaton Square, um, perhaps um, the most exclusive uh, property in, in London. Um, it's, it's a sign of how London property has changed that um, James Bond was supposed to have lived on Eaton Square in the 1960s in the sort of fictional universe. Um, in, in the books anyway, um, you know, I certainly don't think anyone, no matter how glamorous on a public sector salary in the UK, will be able to afford a property in Eaton Square anymore. Um, sadly, I think quite a lot of people on public sector salaries from former Soviet countries are very much able to afford places on Eaton Square. Um, certainly, if you, if you uh, drive around it at night, you don't see as many lights on as you would expect from residential properties. Um, but it isn't really 
just about house prices, though that is, you know, perhaps the, the most tangible effect that this money has on the UK. It inflates house prices in our capital city, prices uh, ordinary people out of, um, out of the market and, and essentially drives inequality and drives dissatisfaction with the house mar housing market in our capital. But far more important, really, in my mind, and why I think the government was talking about the issue of illicit finance in its integrated review of security and foreign policy strategy back in March, is the fact that we have no idea who this money belongs to. Um, you know, if you think about that money that came from Danske Bank, just the one bank, 200 billion euros, None of, none of which we know where it went. Um, we don't know who it belonged to. Um, even if the people at Danske Bank didn't know who it belonged to. They just serviced accounts that belonged to shell companies. It vanished into the international financial system and was gone. Um, even if a fraction of that 200 billion euros belonged to baddies, belonged to the FSB or Vladimir Putin, people who genuinely mean us harm rather than people who are just trying to extract their wealth from a dodgy system so they can spend it on yachts and fast cars, even if just a fraction of that wealth belonged to people who genuinely mean us harm, it is a very alarming prospect. You know, a fraction of a sum as big as 200 billion euros is still a very large amount indeed. Um, you know, we have seen uh, the damage that um, interference from kleptocrats in Western democratic processes has in many Western countries, most noticeably, of course, the United States, when just a tiny amount of money from Russia really caused turbulence almost unimaginable turbulence after 2016, though, of course, there were many reasons why that happened. It wasn't just Russian money, but we've also seen, you know, kleptocratic wealth interfering in elections in, in uh, France with funding for the National Front. We've seen it in uh, Austria. We've seen it in Italy. We've seen it in Slovakia. We've seen it all through Eastern Europe. Um, and, you know, that is an alarming prospect. It is difficult to maintain the integrity of a democratic system and to maintain public trust in a democratic system if kleptocratic owned wealth is coming in and funding some parties and supporting others, individual politicians and so on in a way that is difficult to manage. Um, so I'm going to, um, I'm going to show there's a slide from the uh, Intelligence and Security Committee's Russian report, which I, which I referenced earlier. Um, and it's that, that, that line at the beginning of paragraph 56, which I think is so important. Um, in the inherent tension between the government's prosperity agenda and the need to protect national security. Um, um, and it's that tension which I think is so alarming. In a way, um, you know, our, the government has got some, its policy has three legs. I had it described this way the other day, and I'm just going to steal this particular framing. Um, it's got three legs, the prosperity um, and national security, which are laid out there, and also stability. Um, and it has to balance between those three legs. But this desire to bring in money, the desire to bring in money that led to looser regulations for limited partnerships rather than tighter ones, despite the urgent need to tighten our regulations to protect people in Eastern Europe. It is this um, focus on the prosperity agenda rather than focus on stability and security over many, many years. This isn't just a problem of the Boris Johnson government, but of the previous two governments, Conservative governments, and then also the Labour government that before has essentially led to us undermining our enforcement, law enforcement and, and regulation uh, possibilities and also um, giving the baddies access to our country that we really should never have given them. Um, we have wanted to bring business into the city of London, we have wanted to bring business into our professional services firms, whether those are lawyers or accountants or whoever, and we have not considered who has been paying the price. Um, and sadly, um, uh, the collateral for that, the, the damage, the, the, the price is being paid by ordinary people in Eastern Europe, um, who do not have any representation in this country are not able to vote in our elections and are not able to make their feelings felt about the fact that they're expected to essentially pay for a professional services sector in this country to do well. So if there's one thing I'd really urge you to do, and I, I don't, I, I, I suspect considering who you are and the interests that you have because you're um, here um, with this charity, I suspect that you already, um, you know, I'm very much pushing on an open door here. Um, but what I'd really encourage you to do is if you have any um, access to politicians, if you have any access to you know, opinion formers, please make them aware of the fact that um, white collar crime, um, as enabled by our country, is not a victimless crime. Um, it is a crime um, where the victims are counted in their millions and are some of the most vulnerable people on this continent. Um, they are all of them 
in places where the money is desperately needed and the money is coming here and being spent on uh, toys and luxuries that no one really needs and we can probably quite frankly do without. Um, so thank you very much for listening. I don't know if you will have any questions. If you do, I'll be very, very happy to answer them. Um, and I hope that was interesting and not too depressing. I fear that my talks probably normally are a little bit depressing. I'm now going to stop, I hope, hopefully going to stop sharing my screen. There we go. I'm done. Oliver, uh, thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, it was very depressing, um, but it was it was exceptionally interesting, at least I thought. So I'm going to start with one brief question, which really was, is asking you to underscore what you've said before. Is it really the case in the end that, that nothing is done after reports and uh, coverage in the media, uh, that is it really the case that, the, that, that what the government is essentially saying, not in so many words, is we just can't afford to lose it? And are they also saying that if we do lose it, it just goes to Luxembourg or it goes to Delaware or wherever it might go, and the same thing happens again? In other words, we're not, um, we're not stopping sin by stopping it here. We're only stopping it here, and we're the losers by it. And others will be the gain. Is, is, that, is that in the end the official thinking? Yeah, it, it's a really interesting question. And um, it's been since offshore, offshore as a concept and as a financial concept was invented in the 1950s and really popularized in the 1960s, that argument that you've, that you've just expressed has come around again and again and again. And essentially uh, it comes in two parts. Um, the first part of the argument of why we shouldn't bother doing anything to stop this. The first part is is is, is popular as is, is, is expressed nicely by Dr. John in his song. Um, if I don't do it, somebody else will. Um, so we may as well do it. And the other the other point is that there's no point stopping till everyone stops. Um, because if we stop doing it, it won't do any good. We'll just essentially be shooting ourselves in the foot. Um, and and the the the, bat, the monkey business will be continuing in Luxembourg or Delaware or Dubai or wherever. Um, now, I think. Those are terrible arguments. Um, you can use those arguments to justify doing absolutely anything. Um, but I do think the um, I think the, the, the sort of nicest demolition of them came from Kenneth Clark, the MP, um, in the last Parliament, um, when MPs were debating imposing transparency on the UK's offshore tax havens, in which he said, um, uh, "If you're saying we need to wait for everyone to act, you're telling you're saying that we need to subcontract our policy." to Panama, and I don't think anyone could seriously think that that's a good idea. Um, so yes, I, I think that, that there is a concern in government about the impact on our economy of turning this business away. There is also, whether legitimately held or not, a concern that if we stop doing this, it'll just continue somewhere else. But we, and you know, we in the West more broadly, but as definitely as part of an effort, we have, essentially given that argument short shrift when it's been used to us by tax havens, when tax havens like the British Virgin Islands have said to us, well, if we stop doing it, someone else will continue doing it. We've said, well, that's clearly a bad argument. That's absolutely nonsense. So if we're again, if that argument is not good enough for them to use in relation to us, then it quite clearly isn't good enough for us to use in relation for anywhere else. So, you know, I think that, that you know, we can afford not to take this money. Um, you know, we're a wealthy country. And the idea that you know, the National Crime Agency doesn't have the budget to stand up to oligarchs is patently ridiculous. Um, Britain is a G7 country. Um, oligarchs are rich, but they're not that rich. Um, essentially, by saying we don't, we, the, the National Crime Agency doesn't have the budget to stand up to them, we're just saying we don't want to give them enough money to stand up to them. This is a political question, not a resourcing one. Thanks. I'll go to, quite, we've got quite a lot of questions to come, and I know you want to get, you, Oliver, want to get away quarter 20 past six. So, Here's from Colin Coulter, who was the first to, um, to, to write in the chat. Could Oliver please, take a, please talk a little about the rise of the oligarchs? From what I've poorly understood, English self-deprecation there, I think nationalized companies were divided into shares by Gorbachev at the end of the USSR and given to all Russians only to be bought up aggressively by would-be oligarchs, which then made them gargantuan fortunes once they amassed huge stakes in these national industries. Is that right? Uh, it's certainly part of the story. There are a number of different origin stories, you know, depending on the oligarch. Um, but most fortunes in Russia 
the vast majority of them, not all of them, but but I think we can say the vast majority, essentially stem from leveraging connections, um, whether that is uh, actual power as an official or connections to an official with power into wealth. So, um, you know, being able to essentially persuade an official um, or to use official power yourself to take some aspect of the state revenue streams and diverting it to yourself. Now, that might have been in the in the two, in the 1990s, making sure that a, a government body banked in your bank, um, which made you made money, or it might be that government bodies, when they want to build a bridge, use your company to build the bridge and you can inflate the contract. Or it might be that you have an oil company privatized to yourself rather than to someone else. So there are many different ways of using power to obtain wealth, but essentially um, it is people with connections uh, were able to leverage those connections into essentially hiving off part of the state and keeping it for themselves. Um, you know, and the amount of wealth that has been hived off is genuinely incredible. Um, wealth inequality now, uh, by the best estimates that we have, is worse in Russia than it was before the Russian Revolution, worse than it was before the First World War. Um, you know, the country has gone back to the future in the most astonishing way. Um, the oligarchs are wealthier than their aristocratic counterparts were under the Tsar. Um, you know, the, the, the amount of wealth that can be earned by, or can be gained by controlling power in a country like Russia is, is unimaginable. And, you know, and, and, um, and the damage that you can see all around you in, in, when you go to Russia. This from uh, Godfrey Cor uh, Cromwell. UK law firms and international cases brought in UK courts are increasingly being used to intimidate journalists in the UK. This is certainly a question for you, Oliver. Uh, and elsewhere, uh, who, who threaten, the journalists threaten to expose corruption. Our proud reputation for the rule of law is under threat. It is a very worrying situation at the moment. It, weirdly, it used to be worse um, before 2013. They, they changed the defamation law in 2013 in a way that was supposed to end what's called libel tourism. Um, and perhaps it did end its more sort of ludicrous manifestations when when anyone could sue in the UK on almost any grounds at all. But um, at the moment, there is a very worrying um, series of uh, legal actions being taken against a friend of mine, Catherine Belton, who is an excellent journalist, who's written a very, very good book um, about the rise of Vladimir Putin, the rise of the, of the Kremlin elite in Russia. And a, and a number of um, people mentioned in the book have objected to the way she's described that process of, of, of wealth accumulation and are suing her. I think at the moment she's being sued by four billionaires, um, as well as Rosneft, the big state oil company. Um, you know, that is a terrifying prospect. She's being very cool about it, um, but uh, it, it, is, it is a terrifying prospect. And it isn't just really the prospect of losing a court case that's so alarming. Um, the, the prospect is more being bankrupted before you even get to court, because it's so expensive to try and defend one of these cases. Um, so I think it would be a very good idea if um, we could agree that costs need to be capped in cases like this. Um, essentially, because the situation as it stands, if you come up against an oligarch, is as if you're playing poker against someone and you've got two chips and they've got a small mountain of chips. It doesn't really matter what your hand is, you're going to lose. You cannot compete against someone with that much more money than you. Um, and that's the situation that many journalists find themselves in. And these aren't just British journalists. We see these um, uh, defamation suits being have been used against, um, or threats of defamation against, uh, certainly friends, journalists I'm friends with in Malta and in, in Angola, um, in, in Zimbabwe and elsewhere. Um, you know, Britain has a, a, you know, a very aggressive defamation uh, legal culture. And it's, and it's sort of essentially a form of privatised censorship that is operating all over the world. So yes, I, I would I would like to see a further reform to, to certainly to cap costs in defamation cases, if not to go further and, and, and to bring in a, a right to free speech like they have in the United States. I certainly endorse your, your endorsement of Catherine Belton's book. It was an extraordinarily good book and took uh, some time to write. It took a great deal of care to write. And it's, it, as we now see, it's taken a great deal of courage to write. Uh, I, like you, hope she comes through it. From Felix Corley, uh, could the UK adopt laws that ban entities that do not reveal their beneficial ownership from conducting business? Well, I, I would really like to see that. Um, 
um, I would like to see essentially um, it, it would be illegal to have anonymously owned companies in the UK. And, and an anonymously owned company, if you think about it, is an absolute absurdity. Um, a limited company, if you think about what it is, um, why does anyone operate via a limited company via, rather than just in their own name? It's so that if, the, if their business goes wrong, their, lim their, their liabilities are limited. They don't get bankrupted themselves. It's just the company that gets bankrupted. It's a form of insurance um, that we as a, a society guarantee in order to try and encourage entrepreneurship to, to grow the economy so we all get more prosperous. Um, essentially, we're writing an insurance policy for business people so that they can um, all make us prosperous and, and we'll all do better. Um, the idea of an anonymous insurance company is, is, is an absurdity. You know, if you could take out an anonymous insurance company, an insurance policy, you'd burn down your house and no one would have any idea who was ending up with the cash. Um, you know, it is, it is daft. We've somehow sleptwalked into a situation whereby this is, this is what we've got. Um, but at the moment, as I was saying, um, our company's house, though it is very transparent, it is such a mess in terms of the lack of, um, uh, the lack of regulation and the lack of verification of the information that is provided, that, that we have in a way a sort of worst of both worlds system and that it looks very good. It looks very transparent and, and, and very democratic when actually, you know, the information is, you know, it's garbage in, garbage out. It's not worth anything at all. Um, my my favourite uh, person in company's house, his name is XXX Stalin. Um, <laughs> someone clearly created it as a joke, but 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 running him a close second is someone whose name is XXX. X, 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 X. So, I mean, you can essentially, if you go to a company's house and just type in any random combination of letters, you can almost always find someone with that name. There are just so many obviously fraudulent entities. And, and you know, this is supposed to be policed by, you know, company's house and others, but there's only ever been one prosecution uh, for illegally filing, uh, deliberately filing false information with company's house. That was a gentleman called Kevin Brewer, um, who created two companies and politicians' names specifically to expose uh, to the politicians in question, how easy it was to fraudulently claim create companies. He didn't do anything illegal with the companies. He just created them and then told the politicians who'd done it and said, there, look how easy that was. One of them was the name of Vince Cable. It was called Vince Cable Services Limited. And the other was in the name of James Cleverly and was called Cleverly Clogs Limited. Um, his, uh, the response of the, of the company's house and the insolvency service was to, was to prosecute him. And he had no choice but to plead guilty. He had done what, he, what they said he'd done. He just had done it as a whistleblower rather than as a crook. So that was the response of the company's house was essentially the only crime was to embarrass it rather than anything else. I mean, it is a disgrace, um, quite frankly. And, um, and the government keeps promising to do something about it. And yet, mysteriously, never quite getting around to doing it. There's uh, several people who have put their hands up to come in and I'll come to them in a minute. There's one more uh, on the chat list and it's from a member of the audience who wants to see a little optimism creep into this. Uh, it's from Leo Bear, I think that's the right. Uh, and he asks, is there a model country in terms of money laundering and financial regulation? You mean is a model country for money laundering or for fighting? No, no, I, think it, I think it's one that doesn't <laughs> or does very uh, little of money laundering. Um, not really. I think that's um, right. Yeah, I mean, the, the essentially what the, in, in Europe, in which I include the UK for our purposes, um, we tend to be relatively good when it comes to transparency. Um, certainly compared to the United States, we tend to be quite good at revealing who owns things. Um, but we tend to be exceptionally bad when it comes to prosecuting financial crime. It doesn't almost doesn't happen at all um, in Europe, in the UK. Um, whereas in the US, they tend to be very good at prosecuting financial crime um, up to almost the point of absurdity sometimes, um, but very bad when it comes to transparency. Um, you know, US shell companies are, are, have long been the, by far the worst um, offenders in the global shell company game. Um, but there are signs of hope on the other side of the Atlantic. Um, in the very end of last year, uh, despite Donald Trump's attempts to squash it, Congress passed a Financial Transparency Act, which is passing, uh, which will uh, essentially create a registry of ownership of shell companies. This is going to take a very long time. There are so many companies and they're all in different states, but, but they will create that registry. Um, so hopefully progress is happening um, in the United States. Um, sadly, I haven't seen any concomitant progress in the EU or the UK towards greater enforcement of financial crime regulations. But I suppose I have this sort of long-term um, uh, hope that we could somehow meld our systems and gain 
sort of US enforcement and EU transparency. But to be honest, knowing my luck, it'd probably work the other way around. We'd probably end up with US transparency and EU enforcement, but you can but dream. So no, is there a is there a, a, a golden place? Not really. New Zealand probably comes closest. New Zealand had a big problem, um, recognised the problem, um, uh, analysed it correctly and passed some very straightforward laws which squeezed the problem out. Um, so New Zealand has done pretty well. It used to be as, as much of a problem as the UK is in shell company terms, but isn't anymore. So, um, but, but, but it's a relatively small economy. And so it's, it's a bit easier to do things over there. One of the people who have a hand up is Daniel Franklin, who uh, if he's the Daniel Franklin I know, he's from The Economist. Daniel, you, you please ask your question, but you have to unmute yourself first. Uh, thanks very much, John. Yes, um, that, that's the same one. Um, uh, thanks for a, a, a brilliant uh, description of, of, the, of, of the problem, of the phenomenon, extraordinary as it is. I, I wondered if you could focus a little bit more on the, on the remedy or potential remedies. What would you have liked to have seen in the Queen's speech on this? What would really uh, have begun to make a difference? Thanks. Um, I mean, I would, I would love to have seen you know, just, I mean, I, I have a, I have a bit of a tendency of, of just reeling off a wish list, which is a bit sort of like, you know, like a, um, when I was a kid writing a list of all the things I wanted for Christmas, you know, I'd have a computer and a pony and a car. Um, what I'd really like um, would be that, that a repeat of the promise that, that, that was made in 2019 about revealing offshore ownership of, of UK property, um, you know, almost 100,000 properties in England and Wales are owned offshore. It's, it's not a small amount of property. And that's largely concentrated in London. I think it's about 40,000 properties in London. Um, so that's a very big deal um, and concentrated kind of at the top end of the market as well. So, you know, not all of those are owned by kleptocrats. A lot are owned by investment firms and so on in, in, in registered in Jersey. But, you know, a lot are owned suspiciously and in, in, in dodgy places. We don't want that, that money here. I would love to have seen that... Um, repeated. I would like to see a proper commitment to reforming Companies House. Um, so the, at the very least, the information filed with Companies House is verified. Um, and issues like this absurd issue with, with Scottish Limited Partnerships um, not being reformed um, would never happen again. Um, I would also like to see a genuine commitment to, to um, resourcing the National Crime Agency so it's able to do the job that it's been set up to do. Um, you know, the National Crime Agency um, agents who, who, who work for it earn, a, 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 on average, 13% less than their counterparts in a normal territorial police force. Um, they have a harder job um, with less sort of, with longer hours and, you know, and they get paid significantly less in order to do it. Um, and as soon as they have any training in combating financial crime, they can jump ship to the private sector um, to gain, you know, on the spot, a 40 or 50% pay rise. So it's a totally crazy situation. So those would be my three wish lists. One would be transparency of offshore owned property. Two, a properly um, resourced way of checking the information provided to a company's house. And the third one would be just to properly resource our regulatory agencies so they have a chance. You know, they're, they're, it's not so much fighting with one hand tied behind their backs. So, so it's all their, it's both their feet tied together and both their arms. Um, at the moment, you know, they're so scandalously under-resourced. Um, you know, once we've done those things, we'd be able to see whether the laws that we already have work. Um, you know, and it's only when we see if the laws we already have work, we can see if we need any new laws. Um, but at the moment, we, we have lots of laws. Um, we just don't enforce them. Um, and I think that's the, the issue. George Kegler had, uh, had his hand up. Uh, George, can you unmute yourself and come in with your question? Okay, there we go. There okay. you go. That's it. Hey, Oliver, I met you a couple of years ago at UCL at a lecture given by a Russian uh, on the educational system. And I was impressed with your comments. We talked about the near and abroad. And I think your talk today is terrific. I'm going to share it as I can, uh, given the technology, with a number of my friends who are in high places in finance. Now, I, I want to point something out. Janet Yellen is uh, now the Secretary of Treasury. They're focusing on a beggar thy neighbor tax issue between countries. I think it's the introduction to a discussion about what you're talking about now. They've got to get a, a unanimity of the, the international tax regimen 
then I think they'll use that entree to approach the questions that you've been raising today. And I think it, it's a very clear objective of Yellen and Biden. And I think that some of the cyber mischief that's going on is just a quid pro pro for everybody who wants to go after the topics you're talking to. I loved your talk. Thank you very much. And thanks. Thanks very much. Yeah, I'm very heartened by what Janet Yellen has been saying. Um, she's been very much on side. It's a little bit weird, this sort of wrenching change from being very alarmed um, by the US administration until uh, last year and then suddenly being very heartened by it this year. Um, but I certainly approve of, of the tax changes. I think they're, they're, they're brilliant and, um, you know, really important um, way of solving quite a lot of the issues we have as a world. Um, and also, you know, there seems to be a firm commitment by White House officials to help fight kleptocracy as well. Um, uh, you know, and a, and, a, and, a, and a real strong recognition that it's not just a, a law and order issue, but also a national security issue, which is so heartening um, and, you know, fantastic, really. So, you know, well done to Janet Yellen and basically and, and to and, and Biden and all his team. And I'd, I'd like to see a, a sort of equivalent um, commitment um, here. I mean, it's, you know, it's just depressing. Again, I don't want to go on and on about the Queen's speech, but it's really depressing that, you know, that, that essentially the, the, the argument why there weren't, you know, illicit finance issues in the Queen's speech was because that, you know, there, there just isn't time that, you know, they're clearing up the mess caused by COVID and so on. And I totally understand that. That obviously is a very serious issue. But if you look at some of the measures there were in the Queen's speech, like defending, I put this in inverted commas, but defending free speech in universities or, or um, in, in insisting on uh, production of uh, photo ID in order to vote and so on. I mean, you know, if these are solutions, the problems they're solutions to are very small if, if, if they exist at all. Um, so that if there was time to do that, why wasn't there time to, to, to take action against some genuinely serious issues? Um, you know, the, the fraud costs you know, people in the UK billions of pounds every year. And those people tend to be, you know, older and more vulnerable people who, who can't afford to lose the money. Um, and yet, there, you know, there is time to to in, in impose voter ID requirements in, in you know, in, in, it's absurd really and very depressing. I've got a note here that Hosking has raised a hand. Uh, if it's the Hosking who's a Jeffrey Hosking, uh, he is one of the most distinguished of writers of uh, his generation of Soviet and Russian historians, uh, the Reith lecturer some years ago. Uh, it's good to hear from you. Jeffrey, can you unmute yourself and come in? Thank you very much, Oliver. It was an absolutely fascinating talk, extremely interesting. Quite a lot of it was familiar to me, but a lot was not, and I've learned a lot. Uh, the government's persisting, persistent blocking of attempts to throw serious light on the abuses you talk about, uh, its failure to do anything about the Foreign Affairs Committee's report, the Intelligence Security Committee's report, rather does naturally raise the suspicion that they, or at least their chums, the chumocracy, that the links they have with Russian and other oligarchs actually means that they're knowingly complicit in the crimes that you've talked about. What do you feel about that? It, it is very alarming. To be honest, one of the most depressing sides of the recent chumocracy scandal, I suppose, is the fact that you know, the last prime minister who took financial crime seriously as an issue um, was David Cameron, who did convene an anti-corruption summit in 2016. He Many of the reforms that we did have were brought in under his watch. Um, his comprehensive self-destruction of his own uh, reputation over the last you know, few months has, has, has really helped undermine a lot of that message, which is incredibly depressing. Um, I, I hope that our officials haven't been, you know, essentially bought by Russian money. I would be, um, you know, I certainly hope, hope that that's not the case. I mean, that they, they're certainly friendly with many people of Russian origin, but those people tend to be UK citizens who've been living here for some time. I think it's more likely, um, and perhaps I'm being overly generous to them here, I think it's more likely that the concern is more as related to the Scottish Limited Partnerships about that any measures that would um, essentially restrict uh, Russian kleptocrats' freedom of movement would also harm private funds and hedge funds' freedom of movement to such an extent that um, they are unacceptable to the financial interests who are very close 
intimately connected to many people in um, the conservative hierarchy. I mean, we see this with, um, if you just look at the, the, the places where senior uh, government officials tend to go and work after leaving office, um, you know, David Cameron obviously went to Greensill, um, uh, George Osborne went to BlackRock, um, you know, many current ministers served in the city before being ministers. So, you know, there are very close connections between, you know, the, the, the financial elite and the political elite. And so obviously the, the interests of that elite, which is an elite that, that doesn't welcome transparency, um, would be ones that they take very seriously. So I'm hoping that the issue is more one of the financial sector not wanting these particular reforms, rather than of Russians having got to ministers and telling them not to do it. Um, because if that were the case, I think we'd all be in considerable trouble. And I, I think I'd find that would be even more, um, uh, I'd find that even more depressing than what I normally find, to be honest. Uh, we're, we've got limited time and lots of questions. Let me give you, if you don't mind, three which are roughly in the same area. Uh, one from M. Spalinska, and that is, what is your comment, Oliver, on the sanctions against Russian oligarchs? promoted by, for example, Bill Browder, Karamurza, uh, and uh, uh, Navalny's Anti-Corruption Foundation. Um, yeah. Janet Gunn writes, we have laws and regulation, but don't regulate. Read George Monbiot in today's Guardian. No one wants to deal with financial scams. That, that piece, George Monbiot's piece in The Guardian was very alarming and, and, a, and a really powerful way of expressing something that it's very difficult to write about because many of these issues can seem quite abstract. Um, with regard to sanctions, um, I'm, um, I mean, sanctions are great um, in terms of getting at people who cannot be got at any other way. Um, I worry how, I mean, um, and last month, the government brought in a whole uh, new kind of sanctions, the anti-corruption sanctions, which were very much what Bill Browder has been pushing for for a long time. And many of the, I think 14 of the people sanctioned were people involved in um, stealing $230 million from Russia, which was exposed by Sergei Magnitsky and for which he died. Um, but I, my worry is that in this country, we um, jump to sanctions without doing the, the, the work first, which would actually make the sanctions meaningful. Um, you know, we don't expose what sanctioned individuals actually own because we don't have true transparency of ownership. We don't do the investigative work that allows other actions to be taken against them. It's like, you know, jumping to the cherry on top of the cake without actually building the cake. Um, and that's what I, I fear that we're, we're going as a, as, a, as a country. We go for the easy headlines without doing any of the, the hard work, which actually is required to make an actual difference. So, and this seems to be the case again and again and again. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the issues that currently with Companies House were, were present um, in the, ref the initial reform that was done back under the coalition government. Um, and it was obvious pe to people at the time it was going to cause a problem, but the government couldn't really be bothered to do it properly. Um, so we see this again and again. I, I would prefer they took a bit of time, spent a bit of money and, and, um, and actually took a, did it systematically and tried to actually achieve something. Um, I fear at the moment that, that the concern is far more about winning the headlines and winning a bit of kudos and then moving on rather than actually achieving anything. Uh, Oliver, I've just got a note from Nicola to say that uh, you have you have told her that you can you can take more questions because you haven't got any child minding responsibilities anymore. I, I can hear I know I can hear my my wife has clearly discovered someone to look after football. So now I can hear her with Very the good. other one around the corner. So everything is OK for another few minutes. Very good. A uh, uh, we will benefit from your your children from the ab your absence with your children. <laughs> yeah. Someone has written Jane Harrison. Uh, Jane Harrison has written. We should mention the oligarchs and Putin's links to the royal family. Michael of Kent. The, ca the case of Michael of Kent comes to mind. I, should yeah, add, I will add that he he seemed to be also doing uh, uh, oligarchic tours, but in this case, tours of people to see the oligarchs in the Kremlin. Uh, yes, I'd rather come didn't unstuck come to mind. from a from yes. some lousy journalist who wrote about it. Oh, no, it's nosy journalist keeps poking around. No, I agree. That was a very dispiriting and depressing story. Um, mm. He's um, he's quite popular in Russia, though. Um, I think because he 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 doesn't so much anymore, but he used to quite closely resemble the last czar. He had a very nice since yes. into at the moment. He's got a bit of a lockdown hair tragedy, but he had quite a quite a, a neatly trimmed beard, and so he looked quite like Nicholas II. So so a lot of Russians are quite a soft spotted for him. In fact, I used to hear it mentioned that maybe they should bring him back to be the you know, monarch of Russia, but then Russia found its own monarch, so it didn't seem to need him anymore. Uh, 
someone has uh, written to say um, that your talk was fascinating. This is Kerwin Williams. Um, and that we should be, all of us, she says, we should um, be more, we should have more suspicious minds. In other words, we shouldn't take for granted on the surface, I think she's saying, that we should be more suspicious. Do you find, if I can extrapolate from her question, do you find people, when you talk to them about this, who are not particularly knowledgeable about uh, finance matters or Russia, do you find that people know something about it, feel that something is going on? Because you did say earlier a very powerful statement that this could damage uh, the, the trust in a democratic system. Do you find people well, have got some sense that something wrong is happening here? I think, I think that people do recognise something wrong is happening. My, my concern is that often people jump to being over suspicious um, about, for example, you know, politicians being bought when actually politicians are merely representing a system that has been corrupt for much longer in a much more entrenched and, and essentially pernicious way than just being bought in a one-off transaction. Um, you know, for many decades, the City of London has um, made a living from undermining other countries' regulations. Um, and, you know, that goes back to, to the 1950s. Um, and this is something that the successive governments and and waves of officials have, have encouraged or tolerated in such a way that, that, that it's almost impossible to imagine them not tolerating or encouraging it anymore. Um, so I would rather there was more recognition of the deep-seated, I don't know if you even call it corruption because it's legal, but it's sort of deep, um, deeper corruption within uh, the, the, the economy of Britain that goes much longer and much deeper than just individual transactions, like individual politicians being bought by individual oligarchs. I think yeah, it's not to say that isn't happening. Um, you know, we do see certainly a lot of ex-politicians going into business um, in uh, kleptocracies, whether that's Tony Blair in Kazakhstan or or whoever. Um, but but I think that there is a another form of corruption, which is a very British form of cronyistic, chumocratic, whatever you want to call it, corruption that I think is more pernicious and um, and has far deeper. Uh, roots into our governing system than just you know the occasional bit of of you know transactional corruption which i think is what often people think corruption is from someone called armorer wasson i hope i've got that right she or he suggests that we could all write to our mps today about the failure to include the property register in yesterday's queen's speech would that have any effect if that happened if, if you oh you know what i think it... of letters I think it might do. I mean, it depend on your MP. Um, I think it might do. I mean, I know, you know, this, this, the, the, the bill, the legislation. I, I, as I understand it, it's ready. You know, it's, it's, it's can be sort of plug and play job. It's all been done. It's been worked on for years. Mm. The fact that it hasn't been brought forward um, is, is, is not because of you know they need more time to put it, bring it to, to prepare it, or whatever. It's ready to go. It's clearly a question of priority that it's more important to try and tackle non-existent voter fraud at elections than genuinely epidemic sweeping fraud in, in the economy, um, both in Britain and elsewhere. Um, you know, and, and the, that, the fact that that priority is, is, um, is, is the way the government is approaching this is something that surely they should be embarrassed by or, or, or at very least should be exposed. But um, it's, uh, you know, I suppose it depends on your MP is. I know my one certainly doesn't tend to reply to my letters. Um, but the other ones may be luckier. <laughs> this is from Samantha Debendon. Uh, she writes that, are you, asks, are you aware of any loopholes in the British anti-defamation laws? That British journalists or academics writing about Russia and dirty money in the UK could benefit from if they live outside of the UK and publish outside of the UK? I mean, the, the best loophole is in the United States, um, where there's a constitutional protection of freedom of speech. Um, I don't even that counts as a, as a loophole, but it's very useful. Um, I often had people suggesting that that maybe if there were things I couldn't get published for defamation purposes, I should set up a shell company um, and publish them essentially via a shell company. So if anyone wanted to sue me, um, they would be able to do so via a shell company. Um, I don't think that would work for one thing. And secondly, quite a lot of the people who I occasionally get, you know, interested in. Um, and not the kind of people who would be stopped by the failure to bring a proceedings in a court. They would probably use extrajudicial means to have their opinion felt 
Um, and so, so I'm not sure that we're likely to get around the oligarchs like that. Um, but it is possible to, as Karen Doisha did with her book, Putin's Kleptocracy, and um, uh, Bradley Hope did with Billion Dollar Whale, it's possible just to publish books in the United States and, um, and not in the UK. And then if you want to get hold of them in the UK, you can just buy them from an you know, online bookseller over there. Um, but but it, it really shouldn't be this way. Um, it should be perfectly possible to have a sort of, you know, a mature um, approach to defamation in this country. I mean, you know, it, it's not saying we don't need a defamation law, but but the idea that that it, it, it should be hijacked by the very wealthy is very much not what, what we want to see. This is a question from me, which I'm going to slip in since you've got a few more minutes. And that is, do you think that the publicity which, uh, which Alexei Navalny has had in the last few months, really, and certainly in the last two or three months when he's gone to jail. Um, do you think that that has, will have an effect that people will see in the treatment of Navalny and now the treatment of his, uh, of his followers and the closure of their offices as uh, an indictment of the, of the Putin regime? A further I, I, indictment. Think, I think so, but I don't really need, I don't really know what you'd need to have, I mean, I don't know what more indictments are required. Um, you know, um, I mean, I think if you look at a list of just a few of the Putin regime's actions since, you know, Putin took power, I mean, obviously there was Chechnya, which, I mean, I was there at the time, was awful. Um, then then there was the murder of Alexander Litvinenko with a, you know, nuclear poison in London, which was unspeakably awful. Then there's the invasion of Georgia, which was, which was pretty bad. Um, going forward, uh, invasion of, of Ukraine and the annexation of Crimea, which was pretty bad. The attempted murder of Sergei and Yulia Skripal with Novichok in Salisbury, obviously unspeakable. Um, you know, a series of other murders in, in other uh, Western capitals, not with chemical or, or nuclear weapons, but, but, but still, you know, murders. Um, the attempted murder of Navalny with Novichok. And then, you know, the series of, of uh, sort of show trials and, and and um, jailings of, of opponents over the years. I mean, it's it's a litany of bad behaviour. So I, I'm not. I, I think it's probably got to the point when you know Putin sort of reached zero. I don't know if there's much reputation left to save, which may well be why he's now gone after Navalny. And this is a worrying place to be because, you know, I, I was trying to think of an equivalent to what's happening to Navalny now, and sort of thinking about what happened against the dissidents in the Soviet Union in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Um, with um, particularly sort of Andrei Sakharov um, being uh, arrested and exiled to Gorky. Um, you know, there was at the time a sort of, the Soviet Union did care what people thought about it. Um, you know, and, and you know, the, if, if you boycotted the Olympics, they genuinely cared. Whereas I don't know now to what extent the Russian regime does. And that's an alarming time, frankly. Um, so, you know, Navalny is, is very brave, but he's only one man. And, um, you know, and, and with his organization destroyed, I, I, you know, it, it, it's an alarming time. Indeed. From Mitch Riding, just two more questions, I think, and then we, we should call it an evening. Um, from Mitch Riding, um, my question pertains to the extent to which, if any, Oliver perceives there to be a disconnect or even a direct contradiction between London's welcoming of oligarchs' funds and the UK and other Western countries' democratization efforts on pushies in the former Soviet Union. Yeah, it, it's a really good question. And it's a disconnect that's not only been related to the former Soviet Union over the years, but more broadly, obviously, to, to places like Nigeria and Libya and Egypt and so on, where, where their elites have been welcomed warmly here, um, spent their money here and, and sent their children to school here and so on. But yet we have supposedly been democratising their countries um, in a way that runs very counter to that. Um, yeah, there has been a disconnect between the different sides of, of the country's foreign policy for a long time. Um, you know, and I think that in, in a way that was most, you know, abjectly, if that's the word, shown by policy towards Russia. You know, um, in the, before Alexander Litvinenko had either, even, even been buried in a lead-lined coffin in Highgate Cemetery, um, you know, there was a, a government minister quoted anonymously in the Sunday Times saying, you know, we mustn't risk falling out with the Russians over this. They're simply too important. Um, you know, the the idea that that a British citizen, someone who'd come as a refugee to this country, could be poisoned with you know alpha radiation in the centre of London. It's only a miracle that no one else was was killed as well. It's such a, you know probably the most toxic chemical known to man. And yet, the first thought of a government minister was that the Russians are too important to fall out with over this. It, it is I think it shows that this tension 
um, at the heart of the, the between the prosperity and the security agenda, um, as, as highlighted by Dominic Greaves, you know, report by, for the international for the Intelligence and Security Committee. Um, you know, that's that, that's the problem right there. Um, you know, that, 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 we, that we don't want to cost ourselves business by falling out with them, even when they use polonium 210 to kill a British citizen in the centre of London. Uh, Godfrey Cromwell came in before, but he's put in another brief question, and that is that, that, that what you've been talking about, Oliver, puts number 10 wallpaper in the shade. <laughs> why, why is the opposition not making more of it? By which I think he doesn't mean the wallpaper, because actually they made quite a lot of the wallpaper. Uh, do you think that the somewhat embattled leader of the Labour Party would think that this would be worth raising and making something off? Or would he think mm -hmm. it simply wouldn't appeal to an electorate which seems to be a bit turned off? It's interesting, isn't it, what catches the attention of voters? Um, you know, I, I mean, the, the wallpaper is pretty horrible. I mean, I just think it's ugly, but leaving that aside, um, I, I think it's easier to make the case about um, something that's accessible like wallpaper than it is about something as vast as 200 billion euros being moved through Danske Bank with British shell companies. Um, you know, it's an issue I found when I was writing Moneyland. Um, how do you write about or talk about financial crime without being so depressing? This is probably a trap I've fallen into today, but I felt that, that you, you were a special audience that probably, probably could take it. But how do you talk about financial crime um, um, without depressing everyone to such an extent that they just give up thinking and just go and put their head under the pillow and go to sleep. So, you know, I think it's, if you can make corruption both enraging and funny at the same time, um, you know, and like by talking about wallpaper or in Moneyland, I talk about, a, you know, a, a Saudi gentleman who, who, who got, who became an ambassador to avoid having to pay a divorce settlement. Um, you know, it's, it's enraging, but it's also funny. Um, and I think that, that 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 helps. I think that helps people understand it and, and to take it on board. So I'm not sure that talking about wallpaper is such a bad idea. You know, I think that the idea that, you know, that, that it would go, that, that his his sort of chumocratic ways would be so banal that he'd spend whatever it was, 855 quid on a roll of migraine inducing wallpaper. Um, it, it isn't, you know, isn't a bad way of exposing a, a pattern of behavior. Um, so I'm not I'm not sure that that it's a you know it might look trivial but but you know it takes it can take a you know accessible thing sometimes you know if you think what you can buy for 855 quid um you know that I think that 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 brings things home to people in a way that it's very hard to say what can you buy for 200 billion euros because frankly you know who knows what you can buy for that a lot of wallpaper I imagine <laughs> I think you're in danger of being sued by liberties for the eager and inducing <laughs> comment. Uh, um, Sorry, liberties. Uh, and I'll end up on a, uh, an up note, at least for you. There's a note from uh, Caroline Hutton, which says to you, Oliver, thank you for an excellent presentation. This from Dominic Grieve, yeah, well, uh, who presumably has had Dom to go. So there you are. Dom the future Dominic in the Grieve. liberal wing of the Tory party yes. is assured. Dom <laughs> Dominic Grieve, come back. You're much missed. The last, last question, which is also begins by saying a truly excellent and fascinating talk and very, very good questions. It seems there is a will to effect change and the Chatham House webinar last month asked what is to be done about stopping the continuous laundry cycle. So what next and how to coordinate the response? And that links up with a, a, a previous one, a previous uh, questioner who asked if it was possible for NGOs like uh, the Bayer Trust, others like the one I'm associated with, the School of Civic Education, to, to run a campaign along the lines that you've outlined? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, certainly it, it's very important that NGOs maintain a focus on this, um, whether they're specifically anti-corruption NGOs like um, Spotlight on Corruption, that, who I work with, or, or development NGOs like Bear or, or, or whoever, you know, it, because, it, because illicit finance affects, you know, everything. It, it's the, you know, it is the the plumbing that, that facilitates all crime um, and, and does a huge amount of harm in the world. Um, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a very much a, a favor of the sort of the, the, the sort of both and approach, you know, just, just everything, you know, everyone needs to talk about this all the time, you know, because the, the issue with financial crime is for, for such a long time, it, it's been everyone's sixth priority or fifth possibly, um, you know, in that everyone recognizes it's important, but no one gets around to doing anything about it. Um, and I think we need to shift it up the list because, 
you know, if we could sort out, even a bit sort out some of these issues, it would make sorting out other issues, whether that's terrorism or poverty or, or you know, development, trade, so on, it would make, it would make solving everything else much easier because, you know, it's a force multiplier for the bad guys and, and, um, and, a, and, a, and a broad spectrum inhibitor for the good guys. Um, so fighting financial crime isn't just about fighting financial crime. It's about solving all the other most important issues that face the world. That's a good last word. Uh, Oliver, I, I, I'm sure I speak for the Bayer Trust to say that you've been extraordinarily generous with your time and more than generous with your insights. Uh, it's been for me and I think for everybody, including those who are many in the audience who know a bit about, about Russia, to have that kind of um, exposition of what's happening, not so much in Russia, but what's happening in our own, our, our own capital of London. Uh, and to realize, to know, to understand that not enough, or indeed in some cases not, nothing at all is being done about it, is at least a beginning of, uh, let's hope, of some further action. Uh, and you've been among the most distinguished to prompt us in doing so. Again, many, many thanks to you. Thank you very much for listening, and thank you for having uh, me. Could I just say a few words very briefly? <laughs> thank you. Um, that was absolutely fascinating and very sobering. Um, had anyone wondered why this subject was of interest to bear, I think that Oliver has explained absolutely brilliantly the impoverishing effect of corruption in the countries where it takes place and the direct impact that has on the health and welfare and the everyday lives of people there. And the Bear Trust, which it, we, this is actually our 30th anniversary this year, we now know a lot about everyday life health issues in these countries. And to some extent, I think that we can give a voice to, to those people, uh, voices that would not normally be heard in London. Um, and I think we will try to do that. Um, so Oliver, thank you for your commitment in tackling this extraordinarily complex subject and explaining it in a way that is makes it easier to understand. Um, I think your approach of being <laughs> enraging and funny is, is an inspiring one. Uh, and John, th thank you very much for your excellent chairing of this session. Thank you to everyone else for joining us. Thank you for the very good questions that we've had. Um, I suspect the rest of this evening is now going to be rather anticlimactic, although possibly you'll find a little bit of time to write to your MP. Um, and indeed, I, I support Oliver in saying what a pity that Oliver, that, that Dominic Grieve is not one of the MPs we can currently write to. Um, anyway, that's it. Um, I'd just like to wish you all a, a very good evening. Thank you uh, and good night. <laughs>